first off, welcome to our June show. It's our 33rd uh, here at the Rally Reading Series, which just seems absolutely incredible, but so does so much these days. So I suppose it's, um, you know, it's just par for the course. And I am the host of the Rally Reading Series. I'm Ryan Matthews. And the Rally is an overtly political reading series. So there's so much great political work uh, in print and online these days. Four years, um, basically, since we, since we started. And uh, we've always kind of, the idea of the series is that we want to get these things into the streets and, uh, you know, let them into the wild. So um, we've, we've done this once before, virtually, but never, ever with such an illustrious partner. Um, I'm so excited that we're working with Words Without Border. They have been absolutely an amazing partner and so excited to spotlight their uh their brand new issue of uh of the magazine the queer the queer issue and um so the rally reading series for those of you who are joining who may not be familiar with us we're we're a little bit different um we're going to give you folks a chance to engage ask some questions throw them into that chat offer some feedback um, we usually kind of, we usually, the, the, the reading re usually takes place in a bar and we have kind of a room-wide dialogue, a Zoom, Zoom-wide dialogue uh, now. So um, hope you folks aren't succumbing to this terrible, terrible illness, Zoom fatigue, uh, but it is real. And, uh, you know, so just take care of yourselves. Um, but we may have some first time Zoomers uh, joining us also. So just some tips, you'll see some buttons at the bottom center of your screen. Um, so first, uh, please keep yourself muted. You can open the chat, there's a button there at the bottom. Uh, you can ask questions again of the readers, give some virtual applause. Uh, and if you, if you click on participants there, you can raise your hand um, virtually. In the upper right, you'll see a couple of options as well which is uh, the gallery and the speaker view. And we s recommend the speaker view. Um, you'll see the reader right now, you will probably be seeing me uh, because I'm spotlighted. Um, so yeah, that, that should be helpful. Uh, we also have closed captioning available, which uh, is a, definitely a first for us, uh, which is really exciting. Those will be available in, in, for the English portions of the event tonight. Um, and then, so yes, once, once you're sort of here and settled, to enable the closed captioning, you're going to click the arrow next to the CC button at the bottom of the window to show subtitles. And we'll also drop an accessibility packet uh, into the chat so you'll be able to follow along. Um, and the wonderful Jesse Chafee uh, from Words Without Borders will be dropping other various links into the chat. As, as we sort of mentioned them. So keep an eye out for links there. And again, you're welcome to drop questions in for our readers um, that you may have throughout the evening and, and we'll give a chance to ask, ask our readings, readers those at the end. Uh, I'd also like to mention a very special artist, the illustrator who does the artwork for events, um, Tag Hartman Simpkins, who's an extremely talented queer artist. So thank you again, uh, Tag, for that. And finally, I want to mention that we've also partnered with LitHub so that this video will be available, the video of this event will be available on their virtual books channel. Um, and like all Rally Reading Series events, we always ask um, the organization for and, or, and the audience um, for a cause to donate to, for you folks to donate to, a call to service, a recommendation for sparking debate within your community, or a suggestion for how to confront prejudice or injustice. And tonight, we're raising money for a really good cause. Uh, I usually talk about the cause during the intermission, but we're not at the bar, uh, you can't refresh your drinks, but nevertheless, we'll be raising money for the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund, which is Shade Literary Arts um, offer of direct support to 100 queer writers of color who have been financially impacted by the current COVID-19 crisis. And um, it's a vital source of income for writers who have ground to a halt with the cancellation of book tours, 
classes, events. And so Shade Literary Arts is gathering funds to support the livelihood and work of queer writers of color. Great cause. We've already uh, raised $894 uh, for those folks. Um, and so if you wanna, um, if you can find it within uh, your pocketbook and your heart to donate, uh, we'll drop that link in um, as well. And when we had 236 people, uh, actually more than that, uh, registered for this event, which is really exciting. Um, so feel free to donate now um, or after the show. And Finally, without further ado, I would love to introduce Susan Harris, who is the editorial director of Words Without, Border, w Words Without Borders, which is an online magazine of international literature founded in 2003. Over the last 17 years, Words Without Borders has published poems, short stories, and essays in 119 languages, which is a truly amazing feat. And the magazine's work has not only been transformational transformational in a literary sense, building bridges between authors, translators, and publishers, but also as a larger humanitarian enterprise. And I think in the current political climate, Words Without Borders really tries to bring walls down rather than build them up. So I will turn it over to Susan and, and thank you again to our Words Without Borders partners. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for that fine introduction to Words Without Borders. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. We're delighted to partner with Ryan and the Rally Reading Series. We're proud to present these selections from our 11th queer issue tonight. Words Without Borders, on the web at wordswithoutborders.org, published our first queer issue in 2010. Of course, we publish queer writers throughout the year, but we continue to feel that an annual issue dedicated to LGBTQ writing makes a valuable contribution. At a time of grief and rage in this month predicated on uprising and protest, we can all come together to celebrate this rich variety of international queer voices. Our readers tonight will include the Italian poet Gianna Cristina Vivinetto and her translator Danielle Pirati, the Philippines fiction writer R. Joseph Dazu, who writes in Cebuanu, and his translator, John Bengen, the Japanese poet Mutsui Takahashi, who will be represented by his translator, Jeffrey Angles, and the Turkish novelist Nazli Karabiyi Koglu, reading from both her work and the translation by Ralph Hubble. If you'd like to follow along on the page, you can download the accessibility packet from the chat. That includes remarks, reader bios, and the text being read. We also have closed captioning available. To turn it on, just click the arrow next to CC on the tab down at the bottom of your screen to show subtitles. And we encourage you to visit Words Without Borders to read more excellent writing from the issue, as well as essays and interviews on our blog, WWB Daily. Our first readers will be Giovanna Cristina Vivnetto and Daniel Pirati, reading Giovanna's poem, When I Was Born, My Mother. Giovanna Cristina Vivnetto's first book, Dolore Minimo, Minimal Pain, published in 2018, is the first collection of Italian poetry to address the subject of transsexuality and won several prizes including the Viareggio Opera Prima in 2019 for Best Debut. Giovanna joins us by video recording. Quando nacqui, mia madre mi fece un dono antichissimo. Il dono dell'indovino Tiresia, mutare sesso una volta nella vita. Già dal primo vagito comprese che il mio crescere sarebbe stato un ribelle scollarsi dalla carne, una lotta fratricida tra spirito e pelle, un annichilimento. Così mi diede i suoi vestiti, le sue scarpe, i suoi rossetti, mi disse «Prendi, figlio mio, diventa ciò che sei, se ciò che sei non sei potuto essere». 
divenni indovina un'altra Tiresia. Praticai l'arte della veggenza, mi feci maga, strega, donna, e mi arresi al bisbiglio del corpo, cedetti alla sua femminea seduzione. Fu allora che mia madre si perpetuò in me, mi rese figlia cadetta del mio tempo, in cui si può vivere bene a patto che si vaghi in tondo, ciechi, che si celi, proprio come Tiresia, un mistero che non si può dire. Now we'll hear from Giovanni Cristina's translator, Daniel Perotti. Daniel Perotti's poems and translations have appeared in the Paris Review, the Boston Review, Sixth Finch, New Poetry in Translation, and other journals. You'll find a link to her first book, Fugitives, which was published in 2016, in the chat. Danielle. Thanks, Susan, and thanks so much to everyone at Rally and at Words Without Borders for inviting me to be part of this super exciting event. When I was born. When I was born, my mother gave me an ancient gift, the gift of the mystic Tiresias, to change sex once in my life. Even from my first wails, she understood that my growth would be a rebellion to come unstuck from my flesh a fratricidal fight between spirit and skin, an annihilation. So she gave me her clothes, her shoes, her lipstick. She said, take these, my son, become what you are, if what you are, you can't have been. I became a mystic, another Tiresias. I practiced the art of clairvoyance, became a sorceress, a witch, a woman, and I surrendered to the whisper of the body succumbed to its feminine seduction. It was then that my mother lived on in me, made me younger daughter of my time, time in which one can thrive so long as they wander in circles, blind, so long as they hide, just like Tiresias, a mystery they can't speak. Thank you, Danielle. Again, if, if you're just joining us, if you'd like to follow along on the page, you can download the accessibility packet from the chat. That includes the remarks, reader bios, and the text being read. And if you'd like closed captioning, just scroll down to the bottom of your screen, click the arrow next to CC, and show subtitles. Again, tonight we're accepting donations for the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund. You'll find a link to donate in the chat as well. Now, our Joseph Gazzo and John Bengen will read from Gazzo's story, The Man with a Thousand Names. Our Joseph Gazzo is also the author of a collection of gay short fiction in the Binusea language, Ubangabli Sang Mango Avenue, and the co-editor of an anthology of queer literature in Binusaya, Libulang Binusayang Atolohuya Sakatiktikan Queer. He has won the Carlos Palanca Memorial Award for his short fiction. He is the founding editor of Katiktikan, the literary journal of the Philippine South. He lives in the city of Talisay, Cebu. You'll find a link to his complete story in the chat. Our Joseph Dado also joins us by video, reading an excerpt from his story in the original. Good day, everyone. I'll be reading to you an excerpt of my short story in Cebuano, Ang Tao Nga May Libuan Kangalan. Kasagarang unang pangutana sa mga tao nga makakita sa akong panig kay nga luman. Sagat sa nakong tubag nila kay ang akong pahiyon. Usahay manginit ang akong nao. Di na ko matino sa akong kagalingon ko napigal bako o nauwaw. Kumusuhay kong tubag magkangakang ako o di na ko matiwas ang usap akong pulong araw sila mapasabot. Magbasa o kalit akong ilog, sington akong agdang, 
kanino ti ito bag o kahit man kini, pati na kini sa tong kultura ni buwan sa tuig namin labay. At paanti nga libos si kalang pagpasabot nila. Unya sa kadagahan nga pwede ni mong ibutang simpanit na ano ka na magdoy. Mukatawa na lang ko. Sagdi lang sikat na bitaw ka. Tuod pag ulang ko nakadawa to Guinness World Records na mga ilabing daghang nag nalan nga ipadato sa panit. Lays atong si Charlotte Gottenberg o yung hinigog mga si Shark Hankey nga nakadawat sa Dukinis. Kaya ako ah, puros mangalan o iyalaha mga kalabero palibo man sa langgam. At taya puros ko nga sa tao, musano na lang ko. Nagsugod kini sa akong desisyon ay patato ang nga ni John sa akong walang abaga. Dako kayo kung kukman niya. Sa bagag yun, akong tubag. Ikaw man akong gisandigan kung makalit o kabugat akong kalibutan. Ah, oo, oo, bata pa ko ato mong corny o kiwa pumatiyon. Kuman sa pila kasi mana, iya kong kibwagan, kaya nasaktan ni si yung papa nga naghilawa silang silong. Timing, kaya sunod na ako na uyag kay si Mark. Nagtunga to siya sa Cebu State College of Science and Technology sa kurso Bachelor Secondary Education. Misulod sa ko sa samang kurso tungod niya. Aron dili ni lagyo sa sabusa. Kung sa'yo mong kumplitong tanganda ay Mark, iyong tubag ko man yung usap o kinabot. Tsaka magpipito nga naman. Minisira ko o pagulit na ko, mihapit ko si Gala o kipanugangan o Mark ang akong tutok. Now, John Bengen will read from his translation of R. Joseph Dazzo's story. John Bengen teaches at the Department of Humanities in the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. His work has appeared in Likhan 6, Kritika Kultura, Books Actually's Gold Standard, and Cha, an Asian literary journal, among others. John. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Words Without Borders, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, The Rally, for organizing the reading. This is an excerpt from The Man with a Thousand Names, my translation of R. Joseph Dazos, Ang Tao Nga May Libuan Kangan. The first question most of them ask when they see my skin is, why? I often respond with a smile. Sometimes my face turns hot. I can't figure out if I'm annoyed or embarrassed. When I try to answer, I stutter, unable to finish a phrase so that they'll understand. My armpits dampen, my forehead sweats. How I want to say to them, this is art, this has been part of our culture for a thousand years. But perhaps it's a waste of time to make them understand. Of all the things you can put on your skin, why that? I just laugh. That's okay, you're famous anyway. True, I've just received recognition from Guinness World Records as the man with the most names tattooed on his skin. Guinness also recognized Charlotte Gottenberg and her lover Chuck Helmke, but theirs were skeletons and feathers. My tattoos, all names, were different. What the heck, all names of people? I could only nod. This began when I decided to have John's name tattooed on my shoulder. My love for him was immense. You sure? On the shoulder? My answer, you're the one I lean on when suddenly my world is heavy. Oh yes, yes, I was young then. That's why it's awkward and corny now. After a few weeks, he broke up with me because his father caught us making love downstairs at his house. Incidentally, my next boyfriend was Mark. He went to the Cebu State College of Science and Technology, studying for a Bachelor of Secondary Education. I took the same degree because I wanted us close to each other. What's your full name, Mark? His answer after chewing on pulled pig fat, John Mark Pipito, why? I smiled, and when I got home, I stopped by my friends and added Mark on my shoulder. John Mark got pissed when he saw my shoulder while we were at a motel in Colon. You really had my name tattooed? Are you crazy? I didn't understand his reaction. It turned out he wanted to end a relationship because he had gotten one of our classmates pregnant. 
They stopped going to college while I continued without John Mark. Last I heard, he was running his parents' stall at the public market. Luckily, I soon met Christopher, who was from Iligan and worked at Pier 3. He liked tattoos. He even showed me a tattoo of Mama Mary on his arm. But what really surprised me were the pellets on his dick. When he saw my shoulder, he instantly asked me who John Mark was. I didn't answer right away, still brushing my teeth after sucking his cock. Wait, let me rinse first. He got mad, but I explained to him it was my father's name. I don't want to forget him, even if he's already forgotten about me. What happened, love? said Christopher. He abandoned you? I shook my head. Papa John Mark has Alzheimer's. He tattooed his name on my, on my shoulder so that every time you see your shoulder, you'll think of the two men in your life, your father and me. I nodded. He didn't know there were three men already resting on my shoulders. Love, can I have a hundred? I need to buy briefs. I handed him the money. After that, he stopped showing up. He returned to Iligan. I didn't finish the degree in education because of my tattoos, and also because I dated a student while doing practicum at the Abeliana National High School. It was a big issue, so I took it upon myself to leave college for good. His name I put on my arm, Renato. Then Andres, Monmon, and Frank were added on my skin. Afterward, it was Chris, another John, a John with a J-H, a Chris with a K, a Chris with a C-H-R. That was when I did away with the notion of finding a beloved who would carry on and remain by my side. I had my palm read by a middle-aged man outside the Basilica after Christian ended things with me. You'll become famous and your name will make it on TV. The man paused as if he'd seen something else in my palm with his microscopic gaze. But you won't be lucky and in relationships and love. You're doomed. Is that so, Noi? Does it say on my palm, Noi, if I'll win the lotto? No, because you never gamble. I had the seer's name tattooed on my palm, Roberto. Thank you, John. If you like to donate to Words Without Borders, you'll find a link in the chat and you can sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on our latest issues. You can also post your questions for the readers in the chat. Our next reader will be Jeffrey Angles, reading his translations of two poems by Mutsuo Takahashi in praise of the nude body and gifts. Matsuo Takahashi is one of Japan's most prominent living poets, having won almost every major poetry prize in the nation. Since first attracting the attention of the literary world with his bold poetic evocations of homoerotic desire in the 1960s, Takahashi has published several dozen books of poetry and many more volumes of essays and literary criticism, as well as a memoir about his youth in a, as a gay boy in war-torn Japan, 12 Views from the Distance, to which you'll find a link in the chat. Jeffrey Angles is a poet, translator, and professor of Japanese literature at West Michigan University. His collection of poetry, My International Dateline, which he wrote in Japanese, won the Yomiuri Prize for Literature, making him the first non-native speaker ever to win this award, comparable to a Pulitzer in the United States for a book of poetry. In addition, he has published dozens of translations of Japan's most important modern authors and poets, earning numerous prizes for his translation work. Jeffrey. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and so pleased to be reading this work by uh, uh, Mutsuo Takahashi, um, one of Japan's great poets. Um, the, uh, two, I'm going to read two short poems that were published in this book. Uh, only yesterday, um, which was published in 2018, when Takahashi was 81 years old. In this book, he looks back at his career and talks about the, the inspiration that he's derived from Greece. So, first poem, gifts, in Japanese, okurimono. 
高職なソクラテスやプラトン、クサノポンですらない、ただの少年愛者に帳明当てないの夜の迷路をほつき歩いて、ぶつかったさまざまな若さとの対話や無つごと、上ごとですらない、ただの熱こもる息遣い、しかし、その方向からもらった知恵は、広大グリシアのそれよりはるかに深い、少なくともはるかに細やかな因縁に富むと自ら言い訳。Gifts。Not lustful Socrates nor Plato, not Xenophon, just a plain pederast, I wandered the nighttime labyrinth in Nichomes, Athens, sharing with the young men encountered there not dialogues, Not sweet nothings, not delirious ravings, just plain hot breath. However, the wisdom gathering from those wanderings is far deeper than that of ancient Greece, or at least it is filled with far more tender shadows, or at least that is my excuse now. The other poem is In Praise of a New Body, which I'll read only in English. In Olympia, young men do not wear a single thread. In Pythia, in Ismithia, in Nemea too. In every gymnasium, in every small town, they're as naked as the day they were born. It's because they were born this way they're honest and upright, not the least bit lewd. Like the summer Greek sky, pure and fresh, a model of health itself. What made them so obscene were the girders supporting the eyes of those who watched, girders that came from the deserts to the east. Crossing the seas with warm winds sent by a narrow minded God, jealous of purity and hating health. Oh. Sorry about that. Thank you, Jeffrey. Again, if you'd like to follow a On the page, you can download the accessibility packet, which includes remarks, reader bios, and the text being read. We also have closed captioning available. To turn it on, just scroll down to the bottom of your screen, click the arrow next to CC, and show subtitles. And if you have questions for our readers, please post them in the chat. Our final reader is Nasli Arabibi Koglu, reading from her novel El Fie. Nasli is a Turkish author. Now, full time resident in Georgia, country, not state, who recently escaped the political, culture, and gender oppression in Turkey. She helped create the Me Too movement within the Turkish publishing industry, from which she was then excommunicated. Nelly has published five books in Turkish and has received multiple prizes. She will be reading first from her original Turkish text and then from the translation by Ralph Hubble. Ralph Hubble holds an MFA in creative writing from Johns Hopkins University. His fictions, essays, and translations have appeared in The Sun, Asymptote, Kabibi, Tin Houses Lost and Found, and elsewhere. The excerpt has been edited for the reading, but you'll find a link to the full story in the chat. Nasli. Hi. Hello. Uh, I will read an excerpt from my、uh, new novel, El Fie, which has not been published、uh, in Turkey. So I will start reading by the Turkish text. Çok geçmedi. İçimdeki sapık duyguları sorgulaması için Cinci Hoca'ya götürüldüm. Yere koyduğum indirin üzerine oturmamı söyledi. Oturdum, bağdaş kurdum. Arkama geçti. Dizlerin üzerine çömeldi. İki omzumu iki eliyle tuttu. Abdest aldırdın mı? diye sordu berideki sedirde oturan üveyime. Aldırdım. Enzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Enzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Enzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Gözlerini kapat ve sakın. Ne olursa olsun açma dedi hoca. Başımı salladım. La hevle ve la kuvvete illa bilahi lali lazim. Omuzlarımı öyle sıkı tuttu. Enseme üflemeye başladı. Hazreti Süleyman'ın mührüyle, Hızır Aleyhisselam'ın izniyle. Toplanın. 
Toplanın çabuk diye bağırdı. Biraz daha hızlı sallıyordu şimdi beni. Haydi hepiniz, hepiniz acelemiz vardı demek ki kızıyordu. Gelmişlerdi demek, bizi çevirmişlerdi. İçimdeki her şeyi okuyabileceklerdi. Ne kadar nefret ettiğimi üveyimden ve hiç sevmediğimi babama. Sürekli orama dokunduğumu ve aklımın orada durduğunu. Sakladığımı kalemlerimi, sonra kaybettim dediğimi. Kırıp döktüğüm ne varsa hepsi döndüler, dolaştılar ve etrafımda toplandılar. Çıkarın emrini verdi ardımdaki neyi? Çıkarın çabuk kollarımı iki yanıma açtı. Yere paralel durdurdu ikisini. Alın hepsini içinden. Çıkarın, çıkarın. Ötede üveyimin nefessiz izlediğini hissediyordum. Ne çıkaracağım? Aniden bir eliyle ağzımı açtı. Çenemi iyice aşağı bastırdı. Aç Elfiye dedi. İyice aç ağzını. Gözüm sımsıkı kapalı. Çenemi kafatasından koparırca. Açtım ağzımı. Madem çıksın ne iblisi içimdeki. Kopar, kopar, kopar al hepsini. Sen, sen, sen al gerisini. Sürekli bir emir döngüsü ağzım kuruyordu. Kalbim de telaşlanmıştı şimdi. Ne olacak ruhlarla periler mi geldi? Halbuki hiç kara konculos masalı anlatılmadıydı bana. Topla hepsini, topla topla topla, sıkı tutun, kaçırmayın. Lut kavminin lanetinden sana sığınırız ya Rabbim. Amin dedi üvey. Cinsini şaşmışlarsa sana sığınırız ya Rabbim. Amin. Senden önce alemlerden hiç kimsenin yapmadığı hayasızlığı mı yapıyorsun? Tövbe de. Tövbe. Gerçekten sen erkekleri bırakıp şehvetle kadınlara yaklaşıyorsun. Doğrusu sen azgın kavimden kılınmışsın. Tövbe de. Tövbe. Tövbe de. Tövbe. Hazreti Lut'un asası Yunus'un hükmüyle. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim deyip elini mideme dek soktu, tuttu ve çıkardı. Sapkın ve azgın olan ne varsa, kusturun, kahvaltıdan kalmış ne varsa, çıkardım reçelli ekmek, domatesli omlet, kustukça coştum ve daha büyük övürdüm. Sırtıma sert tekmeyle vurdu, kökünü kazıyın diye emretti cinlerine ve bana kus dedi. Kus, kus, kus, sofraya dek. Tövbe et, tövbe de. Alın tutun bunu, neyi varsa alın. Kazıyın kökünden, imanını kirleten pislikleri döktüm bıraktım. Elinin tadı ağzıma yapıştı. Daha fazla övürdüm ve ağladım. Gözlerimi açtım. Kalbim duracaktı. Ayakları ters dönmüş, kafası küçük gövdesi ışıktan cinler. Melaikeler, periler ve leşiler. Görmeyi beklerken tek gerçek dizlerimin dibine çıkardıklarımdı. Yemek borumdan mideme inen yanıktı. Barakallahü mümkün ve aleyküm, haydi selametle diye üfleyerek gönderdi cin dostlarını geriye Gül Hoca. Tamam deyip üveyime döndüm. Cinsi sapık girmiş zaval- zavallıya. Bundan böyle adetine dek her gece 21 besme- besmele çeksin. Adet olunca 666 kere çekecek. Gusülden sonra namazını kılsın. Kaç bank doktu sayamadım. Elden ele geçen. Bir daha musallat olursa bu illet yakma seansı yapmamız gerekecek. Sakın geç kalma. Elfiye, rutubet kokulu apartmandan çıkarken çocukluğunu kustuğu zeminde bıraktı. Çünkü Elfiye cin geçirmez, sapasağlam bir kızdı. I just need a sip of water. Uh, here is the English excerpt. My stepmother took me to a hoja who performs exorcisms to interrogate the perverted sensibilities inside me. The hoja told me to sit on a cushion on the floor and I crossed my legs. She slipped behind me, crouched to her knees and held my shoulders with her two hands. You made sure she washed herself, she asked my stepmother who sat on the divan behind her. I did. Euzubillahimineşşeydanirracim. Euzubillahimineşşeydanirracim. Euzubillahimineşşeydanirracim. Relax. Close your eyes and whatever happens, don't open them, the hoca said. I nodded. La havle ve la kuvvete illa bilahi lali lazim. La havle ve la kuvvete illa bilahi lali lazim. She held my shoulders so tight and blew on my neck. Gather now, 
by the seal of the prophet Suleiman, by the will of Huzr, peace of be upon him, come. Her jinns must have arrived, had encircled us, and would soon pour over all the things I kept inside me. How much I hated my stepmother, and how little I loved my father. How often I, I touched myself, and what I thought about when I did. That I hit my pants, but claimed I'd lost them. What I dropped. What I'd broken. All of it returned to me. Revolved around the room and gathered itself at my knees. Get it out, she commanded them from behind me. But what? Get it out now. And she spread my arms to the side and held them parallel to the floor. Take it out of her, all of it. Get it out, get it out, get it out. I could feel my stepmother watching breathlessly nearby. What was I supposed to get out? Suddenly a hand opened my mouth and pulled down on my chin. Hard open up, Elfie, she said, open your mouth. I clenched my eyes tighter and opened my mouth so wide. I thought my jaw would detach itself from my skull, seeing that a demon lived inside me and it had to come out. Tear it up, tear it up. Tear it all up, you and you and you. Keep what's left. This constant gyre of orders, my mouth was going dry. My heart was rattling, so then the spirits and the fairies had finally shown up. Ah. Gather all of it up, up, up. Hold on to, hold on to it tight and don't let it get away. In you, oh God, we seek refuge from the scourge of Lut's people. Amin, my stepmother said. In you, O oh God, we seek refuge from sexual confusion. Amin. Do you dare commit abominations such as no creature ever did before you? Say that you repent. I repent. You really have given up on men, and now you are lustfully inching closer to women. It's true. You are the descendant of a lecherous people. Say that you repent. I repent. Say that you repent. I repent. By the road of the prophet Lut and the seal of the prophet Jonah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, and she plunged her hand all the way into my stomach, grabbed whatever perverse and lecherous thing, left down there and pulled it out. Make yourself vomit. I forced up what was left of my breakfast, the bread and jam, the tomato omelette. The more I vomited, the more I let myself go. Having even harder, she kicked me in the back. Teared up by the roots, she ordered me and her jeans. I let it pour out on me, the taste of her hand still on my lips. I heaved and gagged and started to cry. Then, in a single breath, she told me three times to pick it up and pull me back and press my head to her chest. Gather it up. Don't leave it behind. Take it and go. Whatever it was that had come, that had, that had come out of Elfie, the jeans would carry away. I opened my eyes. My heart had nearly stopped. I was expecting to see angels, fairies, and leshes, or jeans with backward twisted feet, tiny hats, and torsos made of light. But the only tangible thing was what I'd brought up from my stomach and the burning feeling running down my throat. Barakallahu minkum wa alaykum, Godspeed, Gül Hoca said, and she blew her gym friends back to where they'd come from. That should do it, she turned to my stepmother. The poor thing was possessed by a perverted gene. She needs to stay to vent besmeles every night until her period. And when she is menstruating, she does it 666 times. Then she prays after a full ablution. I tried to count the bad notes that passed, the, that passed between them, but I couldn't. If the issue gets worse again, we'll have to do a seance with fire 
So appearing curve back right away. Elfie walked out of the damp, foul-smelling sm building and left her childhood with her vomit on the floor. Because she was an iron hard girl, no gene could ever possess. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, readers, so much. That was that was just incredible. Um, really, really beautiful all. Um, I just kind of want to revel for a moment. Um, I don't know, maybe like a, a round of silent applause. Um, I think it's I think it's really, really amazing. Um, you know, there's 90 of us together from all over the world, um, listening to literature from all over the world. And I think that's really, it just feels very, very real and very, it feels incredibly special. So um, thank you readers. And um, yeah, thank you all for being here. That's, that, I'm just really touched. Um, by each of these readings and and each of the translations it's just it's such an incredible way to connect um, with with people um, I also I want to remind everyone uh, about the words without borders queer issue where you can find all of these pieces um, and and please please if you if you can uh, donate to words without borders um, uh, and the and the queer writers of color relief fund uh, to really important causes right now uh, when when folks are struggling and nonprofits are struggling as well um, and words without borders does such great work um, so so both of those um, we'll also open it up to questions from the audience so or the readers if the readers have any questions please drop them in the chat um just uh yeah feel free to to put those in right now it's it seems like we're folks are a little shy please don't be um you know it's it's exciting to be able to to engage with folks so uh, first we actually have a question for our joseph um who will be answering via video response uh, the question is about really what inspires him to write um, and he was good enough to record a video response, which we'll see right now. When I learned that the tradition of fiction writing in Cebuano or Benicia language has been dominated by male writers and their masculine sensibilities, which resulted to underrepresented queer writings, I got interested in disrupting this through putting queer literary works in the flourishing Philippine literature in Cebuano. Seems like, I think, I think we just had audio there. Um, do we, yeah, I think we're gonna try and get the video up um, as well. We'll give that one more shot um but yeah that's that's really neat there we go when i learned that the tradition of fiction writing in cebuano or benicia language has been dominated by male writers and their masculine sensibilities which resulted to underrepresented queer writings i got interested in disrupting this through putting queer literary works in the flourishing Philippine literature in Cebuano. I started writing gay short fiction four years ago, and since then I have edited a queer anthology in Benicet language, which was published last 2017. And just last year, I published the first gay fiction collection in the said language. This is a challenge of a young gay writer like me, which puts out these works, which is mostly seen as a taboo and have been avoided to write about many writers in the Cebuano speaking regions. Perhaps we're in a conservative and religious country. Not to mention Philippines is also governed now by Baigat, 
homophobic, transphobic politicians which ignore sexual orientation and gender identity expression equality bill. Instead, they give attention and focus on a proposed bill which may become a law soon that kills freedom of speech and can tag anyone who critiques and questions the actions of the government as a terrorist. For me, queer writing is a big placard in bold neon letters in their face, an endless shout and chant in a rally, a form of resistance and protest that will not only dissect, analyze, and disrupt the society, but also shed spectrum of safe spaces that nurture acceptance and love in these trying times. That was so great. Um, and thank you again uh, to our Joseph, uh, who can't be here tonight, but I think that's so, so amazing. Um, you know, that he could, he could record that for us. It looks like we have a couple of questions um, coming in. Let's see, we have, we have one first um, for, for Nosley um, from the chat. Um, the question is, can you tell us about your inspiration for that story? And how did you connect with your translator? Nosley, we need you to unmute, sorry. Is it okay now? Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, my translator, Ralph Hubble, uh, thanks to Susan Harris, <laughs> she connected us. And after a little while, uh, we realized that Ralph and I, uh, we were working together so well. And Ralph is, a, is an amazing translator and uh, his Turkish also so good. So uh, the poetic style of the translation is, I think it's, it's so good. And the inspiration uh, about the story, this, uh, uh, this is a novel. Uh, and the main inspiration was, there was an old uh, sex book, which we call Bahname in Ottoman era. And one of, in one of these Bahnames, uh, which was written by Kemal Pasha, there was a woman whose name was Elfie. And you know, in uh, Ottoman culture, women are mostly uh, repressed, um, especially when it comes to sexual relationships. But I think this is an illusion. And in this Kemal Pasha's book, Elfie uh, was telling people how to have, uh, how to have great uh, sexual relationships with men or women. So the character Elfie was uh, first uh, inspired by uh, Kemal Pasha's Elfie. And the rest of the story is, um, is telling, the, telling today's Turkey and Turkey's uh, LGBTQ politics. And um, so I, I just tried to combine the Ottoman era and today's Turkey together and created a character named Elfie. But uh, there is uh, so much more in the novel. So long story short, that's it. That is great. Thank you so much, uh, Nosley. Great, great question. Um, we have another question from the audience um, for our Joseph um, Dezo. He's not here, so maybe maybe we can get John to to chime in here. Um, I guess I guess maybe we'll we'll change the question a little bit. Like how how how does one share works um, to people in different languages and dialects in in Filipino, is that um, is that something you could answer, John? Or 
Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> well, in the Philippines, um, English and Filipino are the most published works, and it's these are the languages that are taught in our schools. Um, English is taught mainly because of the American education system that we have had since the early 20th century. Um, but for, for, for a long time, writing from the different parts of the Philippines or storytelling, storytelling traditions from different parts of the Philippines have all, always existed, but because of um, several um, periods of colonization, they were marginalized. So, but they, um, they uh, persisted in, in popular venues like magazines, and such, you know, um, these are magazines that are bought by um, like ordinary people. Um, so in the popular mode, um, modern writing in Cebuano has, you know, has been existing for like more than a hundred years uh, or almost a hundred years. Uh, I mean, in, in the written form. So it's only in the nineties when, and in the early 2000 when, um, what we call regional writing, which is like a provisional um, term for writing from different parts of the Philippines and different languages from the Philippines, um, have gained some ground uh, over the dominant languages, especially English. So now, um, now that we are in the in the age of digital um, publishing, we can access um, more um, works uh, in different. Philippine languages. So that's how we share. Um, I saw, well, Joseph reached out to me personally uh, because he was going to publish his book and he asked me for, for a blur because he, he, knew, he knew that I was able to read Cebuano, which is my second language. Um, and, and so I read the book and then I was just blown away by it. I've always been waiting for um, a writer who will write about queer experience in Cebuano, because um, for a long time, like he said earlier, it's been dominated by macho uh, male writers. And whenever queer characters come up, it's always, you know, it's always not very uh, well represented. So that is how we connected. I actually haven't met Joseph in person. <laughs> we only know each other online. So I guess it's the communities that we have um, our our communities that li that link with each other that allow us to share our works. I don't know if that answered the question. I'm sorry. That was great, John. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you stepping up to bat for uh, for. <laughs> he's actually. Um, I think he's he's teaching and and and just moved to somewhere new and and uh, the internet connection is not quite stable enough so um yeah <laughs> um i also wanted to just mention calling a, a bit of an audible here but uh i wanted to mention that um that uh nosley's translator is with us as well uh ralph hubble i i don't know if he would be willing to uh just say hi quickly um but that would be that would be very cool um Is Ralph is is Ralph around? Oh, there's <laughs> Ralph. Can you unmute Ralph? There we go. <laughs> there you go. Hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Ralph. Um, I'm Nozla's translator, and um, yeah, I guess this is a what a, what a great event to be a part of, and um, and to listen to Nazla. Actually, one thing I was going to say was it was really interesting listening to Nazla read in the Turkish. And as she was doing so, I thought to myself, maybe I should have had her read to me um, before I actually translated it. Um, just sort of hearing the um, the rhythm from a from a Turkish speaker instead of from my myself, um, I thought was kind of an, an educational experience. So, so I've definitely gotten something out of out of this as well. But yeah, but thank you, thank you for taking the time to to uh to introduce me and and uh, also nasa great job you did a fabulous job reading i love it i love it thank you thank you so much uh for for popping in that's that's just lovely 
Um, let's see, we have more questions. Um, one for Danielle. Uh, how did you connect with your poet and how do you work together? Um, sure, thanks. Thanks for that great question. Um, I actually uh, connected with this poet, with Giovanna, through um, a, a, a translator um, friend and professor of mine, Peter Constantine, who um, was given her name by another translator, um, Marco Sonzoni, who works who works in Australia uh, and teaches in Australia, and he um, is sort of on the pulse of contemporary Italian poetry and um, kind of um, offered her her name up and her work up um, as someone who would be exciting to translate. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, essentially. Um, I've actually, um, believe it or not, haven't interacted with her too much other than to say, hey, I love your work. I'd love to translate it. She's been extremely gracious and um, has said, you know, go for it. And then of course, um, I had this wonderful opportunity um, to share uh, her work with Words Without Borders. So um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been just um, a positive experience all around. Um, but I have to say, I kind of got lucky <laughs> with her work um, as far as connecting with her. Amazing, thank you. Oh, let's see, yep. Uh, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, let's see, we have a question from one of our readers, from Jeffrey, uh, who is bringing, this is a great question. Uh, he would like to hear from the various readers about issues or reactions that the authors had in their home countries as a result of writing about LGBTQ plus themes. Um, very, very resonant. Um, so let's see, who should, who should we hear from first? Um, Maybe, maybe um, Nazla. Um. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> this is a very hot topic for me. <laughs> um, since I announced uh, Alfia was going to publish by Words Without Borders, um, it's it's been an ongoing um, discussion in Turkish <laughs> TV Turkish. <laughs> um, actually, in Turkey, uh, the LGBT movement is uh, is really strong, especially uh, women, uh, cis women, and trans women are taking the uh, lead roles. But uh, when, when it comes to literature, um, there, are, there are some works uh, which were written by great writers like Bilge Karasu uh, or Muratan Mungan. Uh, but I see, I still see uh, something is missing. It is not uh, the existing literature uh, does not provide today's, today's dynamics. Because I think that LGBT or uh, queer literature should be some kind of political. But uh, yeah, in Turkey, it is, um, it is not so safe to talk about politics. So I think I should <laughs> stop talking about the politics of Turkey. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, I, we don't have all of the readers here live with us, obviously. Um, but John, you said earlier um, that Joseph, uh, that you two sort of know each other online. Do you know what kind of reaction he's uh, experienced at home? Um there hasn't really been um, anything like a negative reaction, uh, I think, uh, as far as I know, um, because Joseph, um, it, it's not new for Philippine writing to tackle LGBTQ issues. Um, it's new for, for someone to write from Cebu in Cebuano, 
um, there has been a, an anthology before in, uh, called Lad Lad. And so it kind of paid, paved the way for queer writing in the Philippines and it continues until now. So there isn't really much uh, uh, a reaction that would, as far as I know, that would be like, uh, that would be harmful to Joseph. But at the same time, our struggle really is to get the works out there and to get the works read by a lot of um, readers in the Philippines. So not everybody can read Cebuano, but um, it's the second most spoken language. Uh, so we're trying to, like, we're part of, um, uh, we're part of the, the movement to, to promote uh, writing from our languages. So I hope in, that's more of the issue when it comes to readership. Um, but the LGBTQ movement or, uh, in the Philippines um, is likewise very, uh, very strong. And uh, we've had some um, moments um, uh, recently wherein we tried to pass um, a bill that would, uh, would uh, protect our rights. However, unfortunately, it wasn't, it wasn't approved. Um, but we continue to fight for this um, because among other things, no, uh, there are other, and we don't just fight for, and that's not the only fight we're trying to, to, to do. We also are currently fighting our right to free speech because it's like Joseph mentioned a while ago, there is an anti-terror bill that's about to become law and it threatens our, our right to dissent. So we face a lot of issues um, such as that uh, in the Philippines right now, but we keep on, we keep on. Uh, who else would do it without, you know, if, if we won't? So, yeah. Um, if it's Wonderful. okay, uh, I thought I might uh, share a little bit of a, a story having to do with Takahashi, the, the writer that I read today. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I thought I would share this little story about him. He, he started writing during the 1960s when uh, there were relatively few people writing openly about homoeroticism in Japan. Um, there had been a handful of novels in the modern period, a handful of things, all of which were fairly controversial. Um, but like a, a writer starting off writing about, about queer themes uh, was, was you know, a, a fairly radical place to start. He got terrible, terrible bashing as a result of it, and um, he felt like he was ostracized and so on. But uh, rather than kind of, you know, uh, disappear into the woodwork, what he did was he dug his uh, feet in and made the book, the next book, much more pornographic. And then, uh, and then, uh, then, uh, uh, then again, he, you know, the, the, the, the noise got louder. And then his result was to make the third book even more erotic. So like, you know, uh, taking these more extreme steps each time, you know, just in order to, uh, in order to kind of create a buzz. And um, at some point uh, in the course of doing that, he broke through and, um, and went from being this extremely marginal poet on the, on the very, very edges of Japanese literature to, uh, to, to kind of, you know, uh, achieve a central point of place in the world of Japanese literature. So now, without a doubt, he's you know what probably one of the top five poets in the nation of Japan. Um, but uh, but you know that was a, a situation that was long coming and hard earned. So um, I, I, I, I'd, I'd like to believe that in some ways that that's uh, possible for for some people. Um, of course, every situation, every country is very different. Um, every literary tradition is very different, but um, I think that I wanted to share that because that's such an interesting um, and unusual story, I think. I love it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Jeffrey. Danielle, uh, Danielle do, you know, um, do you know Giovanna's uh, experience? You know, I, I've been thinking about this question and I, I, I only know that she has been embraced by the poetry community for sure. Um, and, and she's, I mean, as you could hear, she's sort of a novelty. I mean, it's the first book of hers is the first book of poetry that um, sort of addresses um, transgender experience. And so I think that her experience as a, as a transgender woman kind of, comes out more in her work like her work gives a real indication of what it's like to to be transgender in italy she's very frank um about her experience um and she she in a way she's sort of i think responding to people's curiosity about it so that i would say that the atmosphere there is is still very um 
is still very restrictive. Um, but there's a there's a curiosity and and there's definitely um, you know the poetry community has definitely embraced her and embraced her work, uh, which is which is wonderful. So, yeah. That that is just wonderful. Um, let's see. We have another question um, for the readers. What advice? uh would any of the authors give to new writers looking to get their translated work published or shared where to begin or any any thoughts um on your experience kind of spreading spreading your work uh, maybe again we'll start uh with Naslam. um actually i I started, uh, I started to publish uh, my stories, uh, fiction and nonfiction and translation, just uh, one and a half year ago. So it's the North American market is really new for me. Uh, but <laughs> as far as I experienced, um, it seems to me the publishing practices are easier in America. I think that's because the di uh, depending on the diversity of the magazines, because um, in every state there are several magazines and, and there is an ongoing fight to be published in the big magazines. And it is really hard to uh, seen by people there. Um, even for uh, American people. So uh, I'm just experiencing the uh, world scene, world lit scene, uh, but I trust myself uh, that I'm a good reader. So I'm just trying to uh, read more from the world literature and I'm trying to uh, figure it out how, how can I how can I produce more? Um, how can I produce more political and more queer uh, works for the uh, readers from all around the world? But I think uh, with the beginning of 2020, uh, I think people realized that uh, people of color or writers of color or queer writers are taking um, are taking more seats from the uh, literature cinema. So, uh, yeah, for my experience, I can say that. That's that is wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. Um, we I know that all of our all of our translators are also. Um, are also writers in their own work. Would would anyone maybe maybe we could start um, start with uh, Danielle this time? Could you just repeat the question? I think it had to do with how to connect with a translator or how to um, sort of try to get your work translated. Yeah. Um, any ad advice uh, to new writers looking to get their translated work published or shared, or probably to connect with a translator also. Um, so I think that I'm a relatively new translator. I've been, I've been working with translation um, solidly for about a year and a half now. And um, I was introduced to it through a translation program at my university. Um, I, I'm, I'm a student again now. I, I've been a published writer for some time, but um, I, I work um, with translation um, through a program and I know for a fact that there are many, many, many um, new translators who are interested in translating work, and it's a it's a field that is growing right now. Um, and so, if you're willing to take a risk, I think you might reach out to translators that way through programs. Um, you know, um, I've also seen lots of people connect with translators on Facebook, um, doing research. Um, you know. Translators can often connect with writers that way, um, and I think that um, you know the the 
the market for translated works in the U.S. is is definitely growing. I mean, there's a lot of people who who care greatly about exposing more English language readers to more international work, um, doing the kinds of things that Words Without Borders um, does so amazingly um, to expose. Um, you know, uh, um, readers in the U.S. to these international works. And so um, I think that there are many avenues for, for getting your work out there and finding a translator. Thank you so much. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to talk a little bit about, about your experience? Um, about publishing translations uh, yeah. or original writing? Um, um, both or either, yeah, whichever, whichever makes a better, uh, a better, better advice, I guess. I, well, I, I would agree strongly with what Danielle just said, that there are, there are more uh, opportunities now for translators than there have been in the past. I, um, as she was talking just now, I was thinking back and I realized to my horror that it was uh, more than 20 years ago that I did my first translation. And so uh, it was difficult back then. It was much more difficult to, to get published back then. Um, the fact now that there are so many journals which are publishing both online and um, in print versions um, uh, has really kind of you know opened the market in enormous ways, um, especially the online uh, journals like Words Without Borders is incredible, read all over the planet by huge numbers of readers and um, the, uh, the publication time is extremely quick, you know, submission and then, you know, potentially a few months later, there's a publication, you know, in the old days, of course, it took forever to send off query letters, you know, maybe receive something back and then, you know, maybe take the second step if you got a rejection or whatever. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, in a way, it's a golden time for, for people doing translation right now. So, none, but that being said, nonetheless, it's still somewhat difficult to, to, to land that first, um, that first uh, a translation. I, uh, public, publishing, uh, one of the things that I think I'd recommend very strongly um, uh, is that, you know, we read a lot read a lot from the language that you're working in to um, having, you know, a list of 10, 15, 20 authors that you think um, are worth translating in your head is always a good thing. Because, you know, as you begin to interact more with publishers and, and uh, literary journals and so on, it's very happened very frequently to, to, to me that I would send off something and people would say, mm, well, we're not really, this doesn't quite fit with the issue that we're going to be doing. However, we're going to be having another issue about um, baseball in six months, you know, can you translate a short story from Japanese having to do with baseball, you know, and so, you know, having a lot of literature kind of under your belt and, you know, within your mind, I think can be really helpful um, as, you, as you begin to try to break into the world of, of, of translation. Wonderful. That is such good insights. Um, John, do you want to, do you want to um, weigh in just briefly as well? Yeah, sure. Um, well, if you, if you're a translator and you want your translations to um, get published out there, um, I guess I could I could I could say that you start with um, translate a work that you believe in, that you love, that you know that really spoke to you. It it sounds really simple or simplistic or corny a bit, but that's what happened with me because um, I really believed in Joseph's work. Uh, and then actually I've been translating for a while now since I started writing, but I've just uh, been publishing last, since last year. And Words Without Borders actually was the first um, place that uh, accepted my translation. It was because of another translator who recommended that I submit my work. You know, so it's also the, the, the community or the network that you have that gets you a foot out there. But, um, I would not, I think I would not have succeeded if I didn't believe in the work from the beginning. Um, and I chose, uh, I chose writers who, aside from, uh, aside from writers whose work I really am excited about, these are also current writers. Um, I also translated Elizabeth uh, Joy Serrano Quijano, who's a young writer. Joseph also is a current, a young writer considerably just publish his first book because it's easier to talk to them to get their rights, you know, for practical reasons. Um, it's harder maybe to get um, a, a more established Filipino writer to, to, to, to get their work uh, out there. And um, 
that you know you have to talk to the estate you have to or, or maybe they've they've passed on so you have to talk to relatives so and on the practical side i, I chose um current writers whom i can who i can speak to very easily so to get that out of the way would understand what i'm trying to do so i just did it on my own I like my love for for translating so so that's i think the first thing and then like they said there's a lot right now uh, a lot of publications a lot of magazines online that publish translations i'm very surprised to find out um uh that there are more than just a couple i before i remember there were only like a few very few and now there's there's almost every magazine have a translation um section which i'm very excited about so i guess if if you have if you have very uh if you have a, a strong faith in in the work that you're translating and of course you have to be you have to also be um ready for for for the uh feedback from the editors and or if you if you get if you don't get published um it's it's the same when you just keep sending you know to as many places as possible so yeah um it's the same with my with my own work um but it's a different kind of excitement that i get when when i get to introduce um help introduce a writer to the rest of the world you know so it's a different thing when i translate to english it it's also a different thing because i think the question a while there was a question a while ago how do we share these works for people in our country who don't speak the language i'm translating to so that's another it's another kind of translation where you translate from one philippine language to another philippine language so i think i'm going to get to that a bit later right now i'm just i just want the work to be read by as many people as possible so yeah thank you thank you john that is just um these are such good insights for for i think all aspiring uh translators um let's see we we're we're coming up we're running out of time just a little bit but um for all the translators um can you i think this is a really interesting question can you talk about one specific uh tricky aspect of the piece uh that you translated um like something that something that was was difficult maybe maybe we can start with um with Ralph, um, since he was so kind to join us, um, is that is that possible? Um, if we can get Ralph, there he is. If you can unmute Ralph, that would be excellent. Can we unmute Ralph? Let's see. Let me find you, Ralph. Sorry about this, folks. Just there we go. Can you hear me? Go. Yep, we got gotcha. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um... A tricky aspect of the piece. Um, it just it it always feels so tricky to me. There's so many things that um, that do feel tricky. I think there are a certain um, number of of words in Turkish that are so common in Turkish um, that don't have equivalents in English and foreigners who live in, in Istanbul um, and Maureen Freely, the, the sort of patron saint of Turkish translation to English who translated Orhan Pamuk and Saif Faik and a number of other writers talked about how the, you know, the expat community in, in Istanbul has, you know, adopted a lot of these words and phrases um, into English. You know, I lived in Turkey for, for eight years and, um, there are so many words that became a part of my lexicon, and it was so easy to um, to to speak with other foreigners and and just sort of drop these words that didn't have any equivalent in English and, and to be understood. So it's it's always really tricky, you know, working with a Turkish text that's using words. Um, I think some of which Nazla had. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the first thing starting with with Hoja. Um, I mean, Hoja itself. We, we might recognize from, you know, I don't know, maybe the closest thing would be Enver Hoja, you know, the, the leader of Albania, but like who, who really knows who that is? Um, but the word Hoja, you know, means teacher and it's, it's such a common, a common word um, 
uh, in Turkish uh, to the point where where um, English speakers will use it as well. So I think the tricky thing is is is you know sort of taking these words and um and and deciding I'm just going to use them. I'm just going to put them into the text, and I'm going to hope that my my reader is is is is going to get it. Um, and you know, trusting the fact that we also have these phones that we can look things up um, in. But um, but but that is is quite tough. And I'll mention one other thing: the um, the reference and earlier in the text to these uh, gold days, Alten uh, Gunlar, which is um, Manaslo didn't read from that excerpt, but um, gold days are are basically like a monthly get together that that um, that women often have, where they exchange gold with one another. Um, they buy a piece of gold, and everybody gives it to the host, and so that way you sort of you know um, accumulate a little bit of, of of gold for yourself. You know, originally Nasla and I talked about just not even including it, um, but I kind of had to elide a little bit. Um, with the text and, and include like a little bit of an explanation without it sounding clunky. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest thing for me is, is, is trying to bring these sort of cultural and linguistic aspects from Turkish into English without it feeling like um, I'm taking this sort of pedantic aside um, to teach the reader uh, before we move on with the story. Um, so my hope is that I, I was able to do that sort of seamlessly and, and smoothly. That was great. Um, we are, we're running out of time. Um, we also loved your cat, uh, Ralph, by the way. Um, amazing. <laughs> Let's see, maybe, so we only have until exactly 8.30. Is there, is there anyone uh, who has a, something just, maybe you can raise your hand, one of the translators, um, if, if something jumps out at you. Um, or, okay, yeah, Danielle, uh, we, very briefly. Sure, sure, briefly. Um, well, I was, I was going to talk briefly about um, the, the switch of the pronouns at the end of this poem, uh, which is reflexive in the Italian, but in the English, I, because pronouns in English tend to be a little more exact than in Italian, I changed it to they. Um, and I did that sort of deliberately um, because of the shifting meaning of they in English. Um, I've thought it was appropriate for this poem. But another sort of funny one that was difficult for me with this poem is that in Italian, the word lipstick is plural. Um, it, it says that my mother gave me her lipsticks. Uh, and I fought for lipstick here because we don't really say lipsticks in English. It's th something you don't really think about. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we say lipstick as singular and plural, I think. So that was, that was sort of a quick one I thought I could share. It's things like that that are just uh, such a delight. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, well, just what an incredible evening. Thank you folks all for joining us. Uh, thank you again to all of the readers. Um, a silent applause to all of you. Um, to the wonderful Words Without Borders team, to Jesse, Susanna, Nina, Karen, uh, Susan, Eric. Um, thanks to Ralph for joining us. That was such a treat. Uh, you folks have no idea how diligent and thoughtful these, these, these people are. Um, they've been so modest, but if you could please donate to Words Without Borders. Um, they are an incredible organization and you know, they could use some help. Also donate to the Queer Writers of Color Relief Fund. Such a good cause. Um, you know, what could be better right now? Um, and again, check out the queer issue of Words Without Borders to see um, the work of tonight's readers and so many others. And um, let's see, the Rally Reading Series will be back uh, the first Thursday in September. Um, and we'll be partnering with the Rumpus then, uh, which should also be wonderful. But I can't imagine it topping tonight. So uh, what a treat. Thank you, folks, all um, for joining us. And thank you again to Words Without Borders. Thank you, folks.